One of the fun things about an invitation like this is I, I get to be with y'all and, and see you again and be encouraged by that. But it also gives me a chance when I get an, an open invitation that I can come and preach whatever I want to, um, which is how I understood my invitation. I mean, y'all, may dis- y'all may be very sorry for that when I'm all over with it. But it gives me a chance to think about lessons that seem to have been well received by others, but also have, has a lesson that's meant a lot to me. And that's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about the subject of endurance. And it's born out of a very difficult time for Christians everywhere, as best I can tell. The last few years have been tough. Um, of course, I don't know what's happened in your life, but there's sure been a lot of challenges that have come to the Morgan family's home, our lives, in the last few years. And um, and so this subject of endurance is something that I really need, and I, I'm really happy to talk about that and share this with you, hoping it would be uh, of help to you as well. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter 10, and so if you'd like to open your Bibles in that direction, uh, then you can start there and study right along with me. For the Jews of the first century who became Christians, they were raised from the waters of baptism to almost immediately be greeted with difficulties and hardships, and uh, it wasn't long before persecution set in, and the, the Jews of which they used to be a part resented them and persecuted them for their faith in Christ. And that, that pressure upon them and their families, sometimes it resulted in the loss of their jobs, their employment, their life savings were swept away. Sometimes they lost their homes, families were separated. Some of them lost their lives because of their faith in Jesus Christ. And so then the pressure was relentless upon these young Christians from a Jewish background. And in time, it began to take its toll on some, and maybe it'd be fair to say it began to take its toll on many. And they, they began to compromise and, and, and surrender and, and, and back off from being the kind of people that they ought to be or just throw up the flag and, and surrender altogether. And, and to, to those people and to that situation and to that dilemma, the book of Hebrews was written. And the writer, by guidance of the Holy Spirit, addressed that in such an such a wise way he presented Jesus Christ again in all of his glory in 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 the historical or even the eternal picture of who Jesus was so that it was intended to leave the audience with the conviction how could I how could I say no to someone like this how could I how could I turn my back on the plan of God from all eternity that brought his son into this world our, our great high priest and the Savior, he's, he's our helper and our friend. And the book of Hebrews was, was intended to show the glory of Christ to be the very remedy to the apostasy, the falling away, the weakening that was happening among Jewish Christians. And in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 36, it simply says, you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. I am a little surprised at the bluntness of that statement. You need something, and what you need is endurance. That that implies... That the dilemmas, the, the, that the pain and the problem and the, prob, the, the problems of all of this, they're going to continue. You know, it doesn't say what you need is for the problems to be taken away. You all have suffered under this kind of load for long enough. It won't be long. Just hang on. It won't be long until there won't be any more of these problems. I, I guess the writer could have said something like that. Or the writer could have said, I, I feel so sorry for what's happened to you all. It is nearly unimaginable what you've suffered. Just tell me all about it. I'd like to know your story. 
so I can pray for you and help you. And, and maybe by you telling me what's happened to you, maybe sharing with somebody else will make the load half as, half as hard. That wasn't said either. That wasn't said either. What was needed here was not a, a listening ear. What was said is you have need of endurance. And, and, and given all the other, and maybe this, we live in a time where other things would be said to people who are going through difficult times. And it was knocking them, they were falling right and left. What do you say to people like it? Oh, you hold them, you're sympathetic, you're, you know, oh, you feel sorry for people like it. Well, it just strikes me that that is not the approach taken here. What you need is endurance. And I think I can't improve on that. And so when I look at myself in the mirror, or I sit down with my wife, and we have to deal with the difficulties that face the Morgan family. I, wish, I, I sometimes wish they'd go away. I may have caught myself almost praying that they would go away. But I can't improve whether it's whether I'm talking to you all or whether I'm looking in the mirror or whether I'm talking to my wife. I can't improve on what's said right here. What we need in the face of hardships that knock our faith for a loop, what we need is endurance. That's a, that's a stiff order. That's exactly what we need. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit more. Um, uh, uh, the idea of endurance pictures in my mind, first of all, one of these Olympic weightlifters. You know, they're little short kind of fire plug kind of guys, and their arms are huge, and, and they lift up over their head, and the bar is bent, and huge weights are on either side, and they're groaning with all they've got to hold that weight up. That is a picture that introduces accurately the idea of endurance. It means to bear up under the weight of trouble and affliction. It is this inner fortitude in a man or woman, boy or girl, that is sometimes the idea is translated in the Bible with words like to remain under. The load is heavy. Maybe somebody throws an extra weight on the right-hand side and an extra weight on the other, and you are, you're going to have to remain under the load. You don't drop it. You don't ask for help. You've got to remain under the load. That's what endurance calls for. Sometimes the word, the idea is translated persevere or patience. And, then, and instead of being exasperated in a situation and angrily throwing it uh, in the towel or walking away because you're disappointed with how God has responded, how somebody else has responded, instead of something like that, you respond with patience. You hold on. You hold it together. You remember, you remember who is the Lord of your tongue, who is the Lord of your heart, you and you hold on. You pay your patience. We're talking about this idea of endurance. It is having the quality which, is, which enables a person to withstand all that the enemy has to throw at you. Let him empty his toolbox. And endurance is that quality inside of us that holds on and will not surrender. And then not only that, but it has enough reserve power to countercharge the enemy and go to victory. So it's not just a matter of holding on. It's a holding on that has the strength to fight back and push against the enemy who is trying to destroy and discourage and just take the heart right out of a Christian. This endurance thing is... It's, it's a, one of these grown-up ideas. It challenges us. It's not easy. It's hard. It's asking, it's asking everything of us. 
And as we'll see in just a moment, it, it, it is put on the list of things that a Christian has to have that make it, make it such that, that it is the very quality that we're going to have to have to go to heaven. Faith, yes. We have to have love, yes. Kindness, uh, yes. All the fruit, yes, yes. But we're going to have to have endurance. And just in a moment, we'll read the passage that says so. Such an important quality to possess. It stays at its post. No matter the storm, no matter the enemy. It stays at its post <coughs> without panic and without retreat <coughs> and without surrender. Look at James chapter 5 and verse number 11. James 5, verse number 11. <clears throat> and if you want to, wanted to look up at uh, <coughs> beginning with verse 7 and, and read down through there, it's, you can see that the, uh, the, the prophets of old manifest this quality of endurance. You'll see in verse number 11 that we're going to read that Job is set forth as, the, as an example of endurance. But what you need as a Christian is a quality that has been, you can see examples of it. I mean, it's, 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 you, find, you can find it in history. And you can see what it is like. And that's the very quality that each Christian has to possess in their generation and in the midst of their own struggles. So here's what verse 11 says. <coughs> we count those blessed who endured. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealing the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. <coughs> so the example of endurance or patience, however it might be translated in your Bible, the example of that here is, is Job. And you remember his story in the first two chapters of that book. What kind of afflictions came? To, what happened to him that, that required a response that God would characterize as endurance. Well, he lost his life savings. He lost his ten children. His wife advised him to curse God and die. And, and because he said, naked I came into the world, and naked will I leave, blessed be the name of the Lord, because he responded like that, Satan tried again, and it got worse, it got harder. And, and he afflicted his body with boils and blackness and, and smells and just off. He sat, sat in a pile of ashes, scraping himself with broken pottery. And his friends approached and they, they didn't recognize him. He was so afflicted. And when they did recognize him, they sat for seven days in silence before they dared say anything. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and merciful. Was Job a perfect man? Was Job a perfect man? This, this admired man spoken so hotly of in the Bible, was he a perfect man? Absolutely not. And, and when I read through the book of Job, there are, there are times when I... Uh, Job, you shouldn't have talked like that. You shouldn't have said things like that. And he acknowledged that at the end of the book. And when, when it came time to listen to God's rebuke, Job listened to God's rebuke. And he responded like he ought to. And at the end of the book, there was a depth of faith and a knowledge of God and a trust in God. He was a blessed man in ways at the end of Job that he was not at the beginning. And what Job had to learn, or at least what the Holy Spirit tells us here in James chapter 5, verse 11, was endurance. You have to hold on, Job. <coughs> Excuse me. You don't know why. The answers aren't given. The explanation's not there. You don't know why, but you've got to know God. And when you know God, you've just got to hold on. And Job was an example of one 
who did just that. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1. <clears throat> Jesus is the perfect example of endurance, and these three verses will lead us <clears throat> to see this particular quality of, uh, of our Lord on display. Uh, Hebrews 12, verse number 1. Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. So again, the the endurance of one teaches us the endurance that we need to have in our own life. In this case, it was the perfect example of Jesus. The Bible simply tells us that Jesus was crucified. Or it might say something like, and they scourged him. And with an honorable modesty, we're not told of uh, the nails in his hands, and the, the writhing of his muscles in his arms and his chest. And we're not told the amount of blood pouring from his hands and his, his head and his feet. We're not told what it was like to try to breathe when you had to push up against the spikes in order to get a, a, a gasp of air. We're not told those details of what, what crucifixion was like or the scourging that, that preceded it. After a, a, a sleepless night, betrayed by his friends, and spit upon and beaten, he was scourged. Uh, probably unrecognizable when that part of the suffering was over with. His back was a bloody mess. Dehydration was setting in from loss of blood. It's a horrible thing. But those details aren't given. All that it simply says is that he endured the cross. And Jesus is the great example showing us this is how, this is how you handle it. This is how you respond when Satan is, is pushing you to the very brink. Faith prevails. Love for, the, love for God prevails. And you hold on. You bear up under the weight. It keeps piling that weight on and you hold on. Jesus was an example of endurance so that it can be said to us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. When Jesus was on the cross, there were no woe is me. He didn't feel sorry for himself. He didn't ask that somebody listens as he complains about the pain and the anguish or the shame that went with that. He didn't waste his time crying that maybe all of this would somehow go away. Please take it all away from me. He prayed at last through all of that and the suffering that would, would wish would go away that nonetheless, not my will, but your will be done. And he prayed for others and he sought in his life and in his death to save them as he did the Father's will. Jesus stayed at his post. He bore up without sinning. That, that uh, unrestrained suffering and affliction, all that the devil could throw at him, and his secret was he kept his eyes on the joy that was set before him. How do you do that? You don't forget what's beyond the affliction. You've got to keep your eyes onto the future as described by God. And it is my judgment, my opinion, that that is a hard thing to do. When the afflictions almost demand a call for our 100% attention to what's happening to us. 
And it hurts and it's confusing and it knocks us for a loop and it, and it almost occupies all of our attention. And the tragic thing that results from that is it takes our eyes off of the very thing that kept Jesus on, on target. It takes our eyes off the joy that's set before us. And that is what allowed, that, that is what was a blessing to Jesus as he stayed the course and remained faithful in the midst of these awful circumstances. How about this? Sing to me of heaven. Sing that song of peace. From the toils that bind me, it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted that are pressing so. Showers of great blessing or my heart will flow. When my heart is weary, when the day is long, Sing to me of heaven. Sing that old sweet song. The words of, of, of that song take us, I think, right to where Jesus was. When, when the way is long, the day is hard, when there are toils and shadows and burdens and it just doesn't seem like we can can take another step sing to me of heaven let me fondly dream what's golden glory of its pearly gleam and that is the very thing that helps us to hold on to not abandon our course not, not abandon our post but, but stay in there when we might otherwise lose our way. We, we've got to remember what's waiting for us. So whenever your unbelievable combination of trouble and affliction come to you and it pushes you to the very brink of what you think you can handle, the very brink and you're dangling by a thread. Remember that what we are to hope for is not that the problems would stop. What we're, what we're to focus on is not that the pain would go away or that somebody else would step up and do their part or step in to help me help you bear our burden. No, that, that's not what's needed. Or that if it's going to continue, if these hardships are going to continue, then God, please help that it won't seem so hard, that it won't be this hard anymore. No, that's not it either. Don't forget what God said is waiting. Make your mind work with faith. Look beyond. Sing about heaven. Don't forget his promises. There's a mansion waiting for you and an eternal life in the presence of God and God is faithful and he's going to keep his promises and you have got to take your mind there. You have got to. You're, it's life and death. We have got to take our minds to the promise, the eternal promise that God has made for us. That is what endurance requires. The prophets can tell us about that. Job can tell us about that. And most of all, Jesus can too. Several years ago, uh, now I guess many years ago, when uh, Adam Vinatieri, uh, some of you may know that name, he, kicked, he was a kicker for the Colts for a long time, but before he was a kicker for the Colts, he played for the New England Patriots and, and uh, had a tremendous career there. I remember watching a football game one time. They played up there in, in Boston somewhere, Foxborough, and they played in the snow. <clears throat> and it was getting down to the very end of the game. 
and uh, Belichick called timeout. And so Vinatieri went to the sidelines and uh, you know, they did what they talked about, whatever they talked about. And while they were doing that, the players ran out to the field and around the spot where the football was going to be placed, they got on their hands and knees and started brushing off the snow until there was this circle there, and you could see the turf below the, that. It was now blown up, all taken away, and then they went back out there, snapped the ball, the holder got the ball, placed it right where it's supposed to be. Vinatieri planted his foot on green turf and kicked the game-winning field goal. You know, you, you, you can't play football in Foxborough and stop the snow. You can't do that. You, you can't stop the snow. But you can find solid footing in the midst of the snow. You can do that. And that is a picture of kind of what the way it is. For, we can't stop the onslaught of change and turmoil and just chaos and confusion and distress and pain and Law, we can't stop that's the world we live in, and that's the enemy that we are contending for. And he means eternal business, and we've got to respond with eternal seriousness. And that can't be changed. It's going to be a blizzard. But you can find a solid footing in the midst of the storm. And that's what, we're, that's what the scriptures are pleading with us to do. And at last, that is the... That is the resolve of faith and the discipline of a mind that takes us to the promise of God that, that re results in endurance in the face of those obstacles. Look at James chapter 1 and uh, verse number 2. James chapter 1, verse number 2, down through verse number 4. <coughs> so why, why does God... Let good people be so overwhelmed. Why, why didn't he stop somewhere short of letting us be taken to the brink or dangling by that last thread? Why, why doesn't God intervene? Why does he let good people be so overwhelmed? James chapter 1, verse 2 Consider it all joy, my brethren. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith <coughs> produces endurance. And then here's verse 4. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Okay, so if we can go maybe work at this backwards. In verse 4, we are to let endurance do what endurance is supposed to do. And it is to take us to the spiritual maturity and completeness that we are to have in Christ. And so this is the passage that I was referring to earlier when we get to see the Holy Spirit taking us to one specific quality. It's like there's one bridge from mainland to this particular island. And if you want to get on this island, you're going to have to cross this bridge. And that bridge, well, you're going to have to let endurance do what endurance does. And it's going to perfect you. And if you want to be full grown, if you want to be mature, if you want to be what you ought to be in Christ, you're going to have to deal with endurance. You're going to have to deal with trials. Because it is a trying of your faith that works endurance. It produces all of that. And so in the, in the midst of the, of the trials and the difficulties that come, that test our faith, because we... We get a glimpse of where all this is going. And, and we, we can stand in a place that we could not stand going at it any other way. We've just got to go through the trials. And, and like a weightlifter, we're going to have to stand our ground as 
as those uh, dumbbells after, or those, uh, those weights after weights after weights are just, they, they keep being added. We're going to have to do that. And those trials are going to do something for us. They're going to produce endurance. And that is the very quality that we have to have in order to go to heaven and will not go without it. We're going to have to be able to endure. And let it do in our lives everything that God intends for it to do. So, <clears throat> he looks behind, beyond the immediate pains. He calls upon us to respond in faith, to trust his promises, and to hold on. How could a Christian look at a situation at difficulties and problems and see those kinds of things where we have to look beyond the immediate circumstances. We have to look by faith and hold on. We have to bear up, keep faithful, and keep pressing on. Look at Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 28 uh, through verse 31. Isaiah chapter 40. <clears throat> Verse 28 says, Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. This is the kind of God, this is the kind of response to trouble that he, he, he responds to help us with. And these are the kinds of prayers that God's people offer in the midst of these difficulties. Oh God, please help us. May we mount up with wings like eagles. May we run and not be weary. May we walk and not faint. The promises that promote endurance, the kind of prayers that go with somebody who is trying to hold on. Everything about who we are in Christ and about where we're going depends on endurance. And this is how God gives us endurance. He opens the door and he lets the trials and difficulties come to test us that that endurance is developed in us. Well, looking ahead, then that is how we can count it all joy. And it is an exercise of faith and it is a discipline of mind that takes us where God wants us to go. And it is an uncommon thing in light of this world. But may faith be what comes to the surface as we respond to the trials and turmoil and upheaval that can rock our, wor our world and threaten our faith. Look at Proverbs chapter 10, verse number 25. Proverbs 10, verse 25. <clears throat> when the whirlwind passes, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation. I uh, came to appreciate that proverb in the midst of things that were sure rocking in my world. And the part of that, so, uh, that proverb that really got my attention first was the very first phrase. When the whirlwind passes, sometimes it doesn't feel like the storm's ever going to stop. <clears throat> have you ever tried to, have you ever played in the ocean and got out there a little bit maybe too deep and a, and a wave comes and knocks you over 
and maybe a little frantic, you struggle to find your footing and, and you get up only in time to turn and see another one coming and it knocks you down again. And, and you know, every, it seemed like every time you try to get up, you get knocked down again. It, it may feel sometimes like the storms are never going to stop. But Proverbs 10, verse 25 says, when the whirlwind passes, when the whirlwind passes, it's not going to be like this forever. It, it is like that right now. But it's not going to be like that forever. And when it's all over, how you've responded, how I've responded, is going to reveal something. It's going to reveal the foundation of our lives. What are we built on? Solid rock or the shifting sand? It's going, to, it's going to reveal what we're made of. And isn't that what's said at the last part of that about proverb? When the whirlwind passes, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation. You know, that, that's, what, that's what at last these trials are going to show for us, or show about us. What kind of foundation do we have? And when they pass, may our prayer be, God, please help us. That we will so respond that you'll see faith in our hearts, you'll, you'll see endurance and courage and patience in, in our response. May we respond to all of this, not asking you'll take it all away or make our lives easy again, but, but that you'll help us endure so that when the whirlwind passes, it will reveal an everlasting foundation. Several years ago, I became a kind of a fan of Honda um, automobiles. I don't have a Honda right now. I've owned a couple of three or something. And, but one of the things that caught my attention as I was learning about Hondas is that one of the owners or founder of Honda Motors observed cars driving down the road that had headlights, one or both headlights that had burned out. And the guy running Honda Motors or whoever, whatever that was at that time, thought that was not, not a, a sign of a very well-made vehicle. And that if he was gonna make a vehicle, he was gonna make a vehicle that had headlights that didn't go, didn't go out. Then it would be indicating that he is making a quality car. And I'm, I'm not saying, you can look down, I'm sure you're gonna find, and, and now you'll be looking for it, but you, you'll, you'll, you'll not find too many Hondas that are going to have their headlights out. And the manufacturer was quite proud that he was making something that was going to endure. At least for that guy and that, motor, that, that brand of vehicles, he made something that was going to endure, and he was quite proud of that. And I have wondered if it's not so like that for God. That he has made us, and he has made us to endure. He's promised that I'm not going to put temptations on you that are greater than what you can bear. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. Not, not, not going to allow that. But here's what I am going to do. I'm going to tell you what's on the other side of this. I'm going, to, I'm going to teach you so that you will count it all joy when you come into trials because I'll tell you what they're going to produce in you. They're going to make you stronger. They're going to produce endurance in you. And it's the very quality you're going to have to have to go to heaven, and I'm going to help you have it. And in those ways and countless other ways, examples, faithful people, this manufacturer, this divine manufacturer, is hoping that he has built in all of us that which will endure. And that that's, that's the aim of all this. That's, that's the kind of people that he is making and citizens in his kingdom. <coughs> so... Um, let me close with a familiar passage of Scripture. And it goes like this. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. 
He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. <coughs> even though, <coughs> even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and loving kindness will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Those wonderful, quiet, those wonderful times by quiet waters. They're partnered with those times that we are called to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And death is so near, we can see its shadows. It's right here. But whatever may come, we're holding on to the Lord who will take care of us, and we're looking forward to a time when we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what faith sounds like. It doesn't ask for an easy path. It doesn't ask that the hardships be taken away. But it begs that God will find us faithful and that we'll not forget what's ahead. And like faithful people before, we will endure to the glory of the one who has made us. I, I, I hope that thinking about this subject will help you if, if you're walking through very difficult times right now. If not, be grateful for the quiet times, but know that those quiet times are not going to last forever. Satan's going to make sure of that. And ready yourself. Ready yourself for the storm to be the kind of men and women, boys and girls, that will give glory to God as the one who's made us looks and sees in us those things that show people are ready for heaven.